Welcome everybody to the first inaugural Kung Fu Comics panel. I'm Curtis Fujita with Patrick Lugo here, and we are going to go ahead and talk about comic books and martial arts, specifically Kung Fu in them. Um, so we're just going to go ahead and start by introducing ourselves. So Patrick, maybe you could go and share a little bit of information with everybody about who you are, your background, and uh, how you fit into the whole Kung Fu comic landscape. Uh, sure. Thanks for having me, Curtis. Uh, my name is Patrick Lugo. Uh, online, you can find me as Plugo on various platforms. Um, got my start in comics early in the 90s for an independent publisher called Double Edge Publishing. But I left New York and uh, made my way to the West Coast to, to become art director for the magazine Kung Fu Tai Chi, where I worked for over 20 years developing it into a mainstream publication before its demise just last year due to uh, the COVID crisis. Uh, since then, I've worked also on nights and weekends uh, illustrating comics and other uh, media, children's books and uh, out record album covers most recently. Um, so that's where I'm at now. As I mentioned, I'm Curtis Fujita, and uh, my background is actually, I started out in the comic books back in the uh, mid, early 90s with Malibu Comics, um, and that was out in Los Angeles area, uh, working on the Ultraverse and Protectors line of comic books. I was an editorial assistant, and then I moved on to doing coloring for comic books, and I've also worked in animation, video games, things like that. Uh, also, I am a Kung Fu instructor, so I have a school Tiger Crane Kung Fu. And so I kind of have these two, these two separate paths that I've kind of, uh, kind of converged lately with this whole martial arts and comic books thing. And so nowadays I'm the creative director at Overlying Comics, and I'm working on my own uh, Kung Fu comic book series called Shadow Ghost. So the tagline is it's the Kung Fu comic by a Kung Fu master. So that's kind of, that's my, that's my pedigree. Um, so yeah. So yeah. Uh, so, and so pa Patrick and I know each other through Kung Fu Tai Chi magazine and um, our mutual friend, colleague, Jean Ching. Um, and so, you know, I've been a big fan of the magazine for, for decades. It's one of the things that inspired me to kind of take up doing Kung Fu. And uh, if I remember correctly, Patrick, didn't you used to have like in the back of a couple issues, you had a comic book in, in some of the issues or, or some pages, is that right? That is true. It's a comic series called Tiger's Tale, which, which was uh, pitched as a kind of answer the questions to young that young readers have. And so they kind of connected me with a few martial arts scholars. But as the series progressed, I was given more latitude to build more of a story and pursue my own interests. And uh, that lasted for a handful of years, then at around the turn of the century, here I am dating myself, uh, we kind of put it on the shelf, hoping to develop it as an online cartoon, uh, mm. a web series at the time, but that mm. kind of put it into a bit of a developmental limbo for a number of years, until I was recently able to um, put some time and energy back into it and I'm now developing it as a middle grade uh, graphic novel series for once again for young martial artists and what is it young readers of all ages that's that's great yeah I, I specifically remember that reading reading those in in the issues back then and it was, it was really cool you know I'm um, working at Kung Fu Tai Chi magazine I mean I think we kind of spoke before about this but I mean you had exposure to like the craziest amount of authentic martial arts and masters and just people from all over right i mean it, it's like the best reference that you can get you know I would it was it was truly amazing to see the the level of expertise that was on display you know and just in the most like minimal ways you had these masters who had these amazing stories you know surviving the cultural revolution you know these like longevity masters who you know could do things that, in their 80s that I could never do in my 20s or 30s, you know? Mm -hmm. So that side of things was, was amazing. Um, and then because of the convention of magazines where it's so much about it was like the how-to aspect, step one, do this, step two, do that. 
um, a lot of my knowledge of sequential art and a lot of my uh, previous schooling and storyboarding really just kind of became so useful to like try and convey the 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 lessons that the a given author was trying to to impart but also like while working with the masters live and actually doing photo shoots with them and just trying to really like focus specifically on capturing the images as though it was a comic panel you know we had a photographer whose job it was was to capture the image and keep everything in focus but my job was just to really try and anticipate how many panels a sequence of actions could be broken down into for the sake of clarity for the reader, but then also in the back of my mind would be like uh, the dramatic impact and, you know, when you could, you know, a lot of the lessons that any art school student would, would be challenged to convey, um, such as uh, what clarity of motion or when when to actually take an image and flip it 180 degrees, right? The infamous 180 degree line, you know, so there would be all those kind of considerations that would have to happen while this martial artist was trying to convey their lesson and try and like, you know, really prove to us, not that he needed to prove to us, but there would often be that level of enthusiasm, you know, and they'd want to show us, this is how the Kung Fu is done. And, what were some of your first introductions to martial arts in the comic book format? What, what, which ones kind of were out there or influenced you or you, do you kind of recall? For comics, it was, um, it's, you know, there's, there's like there's different stages, but I mean, that's part of my thinking has been that since, since when, since ninjas first appeared in X-Men in the eighties, yeah, right. Yeah. Or like the whole, um, Frank Miller, Daredevil. his Daredevil run also in the 80s were like, you know, hitting the pop culture right at the same time as like that 80s American Ninja resurgence was happening. But I mean, you could say the same thing with like my older brothers had copies of like Master of Kung Fu or like the, the black and white epic magazine versions that mm -hmm. were a little more mature called like Deadly Hands of Kung Fu. Yeah. You know, which were much more like explicitly like Bruce Lee homages or even ripoffs. <laughs> you know, I can, I can even, you know, if I share my screen, I can. Yeah, so let, me, let, me make sure, let me make sure I, I got you. Uh, there we go. I, I just switched the options. Here. Oh, look gosh, at this. Look at Charlton that Comics. Charlton you know, had, a, had a Kung Fu, had a, had a uh, what was it Yang or Yang? Did you ever see that? Yang, the master of Kung Fu series, which was really good. Yeah, I, I vaguely recall that, but yeah. I mean, this, I mean, this one just looks so much more like the That's Roy Thomas style magazines. Yeah. But then, you know, you look at like Marvel team up, Sons of the Tiger, oh, you know, yeah. so, right. This was, I mean, that's Chuck Norris, Jackie Chan, and, <laughs> you know, help me out with the third name. I'm missing Jim Kelly. Kelly. Jim Kelly. Yes. <laughs> you know? And so, I mean, I remember this. I remember, of course, Iron Fist. I don't think I have one of those here. But yeah, so in terms of early influences, it just like, it was like the comics, the comics and like the pop culture were already side by side. You know, I was reading the comics at the same time as I was uh, watching Black Belt Theater on a Sunday afternoon, you know, yeah. so. They just kind of always were there parallel, but then they would, you know, every handful of years, there would be a resurgence, right? Like the Daredevil, you know, Frank Miller era, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, sure. you know? And I think, I think, I think we're kind of facing one now with this like epic, you know, insurgence of martial arts themes and comics. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that's the wave that I'm hoping to, to catch a little bit of, you know, and it's, for me, it was, it was definitely like Frank Miller's run on Daredevil was like amazing. Um, and uh, what would really, what really originally I think was one big things was Larry Hammer's work on GI Joe with Snake Eyes and Storm Shadow. Yeah. And this was really, was really, really cool. And then of course, then when I got into like uh, manga and, and Japanese anime and stuff like that, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Fist of the North Star. That was 
Um, yes. Absolutely, absolutely insane. I mean, I remember I had a friend from Japan, and it's before those books got localized. And I was、mm-hmm. showing him an X Men comic book, and I was saying, "Well, Wolverine's the toughest guy out there." And he said, "You know, there's a guy that can touch somebody with his index finger and make their entrails explode." And he started showing me this, and I was like, "Is this like, you know, what type of comic book?" He goes, "For kids, the kids love it." You know, and I, the funny story he told me is that they had in, in Japanese school, they had to teach you typing. They had a program where you had to type the letters fast enough on the computer, and if you type the word out fast enough, the character would. The Kenshiro character would actually hit the person's pressure points, and their stomach would explode. And that was in school, in grade school, for the kids to help them learn how to type. So <laughs> amazing! I do, re- I do remember、yeah. Fist of the North yeah. Star. Yeah. But I, I was exposed to that first on VHS tapes、oh, through、yeah. the through the anime. You know where、sure. we were. Once again, I was I was in art school, so we were like、uh, spearheading、uh, college. Newspaper comic revival,、mm-hmm. where we just basically took the local college newspaper and just focused it all on comics. So like it was four pages of news, which was like a dust jacket to like this sixteen pages of you know newspaper sized comics that we all like contributed to. That's and, awesome. You know, we would each we each had our own series. We'd each write our own article. We interview. You know, luminaries of the time, whoever we can get a hold of, you know. And and I think I think that's that that's kind of the the thing that I love about the art form, right? Is, of course, varying degrees of success, right, and varying degrees of ability. But like you know, when we do our our Silver Line、uh, comics、um, live streams and stuff like that, right, and we're talking to people, we get people chiming and saying, "Oh, well, I." Or I even have friends say, "Oh, I want to make a comic book, so you know, I want to pitch this idea, and 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 then maybe the company will do it."、And、nothing stopping you from doing it. In fact, usually most companies will say, "Go ahead and make it, and then come back to us." Right? It's it's, it, but it's one of those great art forms that you know, if you have the will and the time, you can make it. it you don't need a, a camera. You don't need a big computer. You just need a pen and paper, really. You know, and that that's what's so、yeah. great about it. Yeah. Right, and that once again perfectly ties us back to the theme of like you know kung fu because that's the exact parallel, <laughs> right? It's about the whole getting it done a page at a time, you know. So like、mm-hmm. as a kung fu master yourself, you probably had to describe that method of kung fu being a thing that you build over time with discipline. You know, it's not like this quick thing. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's it's inch by inch, right? You know, I find working on Shadow Ghost, it's like, and I don't know, if, maybe it's just me, right? But but it's like every panel is a bit is it is its own separate challenge. Every panel is its own reward. I love that that kind of microcosm macrocosm aspect to it. You know, it's not one picture; it's many little pictures, and that's. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, totally. And、uh, it's I think that's what.、Uh, Well, let, let me put it. Let me、uh, let me ask you a question.、Mm, sure. Um, how does how does one convey kung fu in a fight scene that is different than convey than conveying the lack of kung fu in a fight scene?、Mm-hmm. But that is just like drawing a bad fighter. You mean、um, like how, how, like what would be my approach to 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 kind of depicting that? Like like in my own work, kind of or. Well, I definitely want you to look at it within the context of your own work, but I think like,、um, okay, let me let me let me let me dial it back. Okay. For all of its greatness,、uh-huh. the Batman Adam West Batman TV show created the cl- the cliche of bang, pop, wham. Yeah. And that became like a shorthand to convey action. Sure. And then you have comics where comics is so much about the shorthand, right? You only have X number of pages to convey information. So then, how does an artist use that shorthand to differentiate a fighter known for their kung fu, like Shang Chi or Iron Fist? Or like over in DC Comics, you have what Batman and Richard Dragon. Yeah. So how would how would an artist what would an artist have to bring to differentiate those characters from say your Incredible Hulk、uh-huh. or your Superman who doesn't need to have any martial skill whatsoever? 
Well, I mean, that's interesting because I would say, I would say, you know, it all depends on, of course, on the artist. But I, you know, my my view it is, I'm, I kind of think of it a little bit differently than the way it's already been depicted. But usually, um, it's depicted a lot of times the expertise is by how many people they can take on at once, right? Usually, that's you have a great splash page of Iron Fist, and he's doing like a a jumping sidekick on one guy and disabling another guy's weapon because they're trying to depict all these things in one panel, you know. Um, so I'd say that 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 that's usually the, the the case, you know, is the multiple opponent thing is usually the way I've I've seen it depicted, you know. Um, but for me personally, what I'm trying to do because I have some you know storyboarding background stuff like that, and you know teaching kung fu, you know, I specifically chose when I'm doing Shadow Ghost to use short, smaller panels. It's almost like a a little bit more like in line with like Watchmen and Dave Gibbons' work on that, where it's it's very classical because to me it's more about the context of panel to panel to panel to panel and showing the continuity of movement as somebody who does kung fu you know which is kind of counter to how it normally is depicted normally it's about the the the, the spectacle of it you know and so it's usually about a big panel big uh you know big posing things like that so that's kind of my my take on it what about what about you how do you how do you see that Man, I, I think I think you conveyed it really well in terms of the concept of breaking down the panels. I mean, I think there's, I think that's an ongoing riddle. Like I, I could name a f like, uh, and I actually can't even name the artist now. But like the current, I just was reading the most recent issues of Black Widow. Okay. Right, God, the Miss likes to read it too. So you know, it's one of those like bring the bring the family together comics. Yeah. But the artist whose name is totally um, is totally escaping me, has been um, bringing back the how would you describe it? It's it's a it's almost like a, a single double page spread, mm -hmm. one setting, and then it's just you know the entire choreography is just moving across that one double page spread with you know multiple drawings of the character sure. jumping and you you know in this case black widow you know using the furniture and dodging and fighting and taking on once again multiple opponents yeah over the course but i think it was just like the beauty of it is the use of space as yeah. well you know like in terms of like planning out how the character black widow another excellent martial arts character mm -hmm. um is using space to fight you know so it's not it's almost the opposite because it's just one giant panel yeah but it's just the fact that it's planned out so meticulously so that you could just you know see it as though it was one continuous shot definitely i mean it's there's that's what i love about comic books is there's that it's a very active participation you have mm -hmm. as a reader and i would venture to say that most other art films like you know usually when you see film or tv it's just kind of fed to you right this is how i want you to see it this is how I want you to interpret it, you know, more or less, at least visually. But in comic books, the, the way that the eye is trained to follow the movement, like like what you're talking about, reminds me of Frank Miller's book, right? Well, we'll have like Daredevil doing somersaults and, you know, all this stuff on the page. And your eye actually becomes the, the camera pan, right? It pans mm -hmm. across and, you know, so, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it, it, it's fascinating, you know, it's, it, it really is, you know, to see how people solve those problems, you know, and engage the reader. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's also interesting to see, um, like how how closely a given artist is paying attention to those details. You know, like I I think of the comp the manga series Akira. Oh God, and, I love that book. <laughs> and how the con like one thing that always stuck out for me about that that manga series was not that was like, and it wasn't like there was a lot of punches no. being thrown in that series, but very often you never saw the punch you only you always saw like a fraction of a second after the punch you know and the face being distorted and the the little spark of impact and how much more effective that was because you were seeing you were experiencing the impact of the punch rather than seeing the depiction of a punch in like a jim lee style pinup or something no, as, as as somebody who's trained martial arts for you now it's been a couple of decades and who has gotten punched in the face, that's usually how it is. You <laughs> you get hit and you kind of realize it afterwards, right? You get hit and your head snaps to the side. 
and that's when it dawns on you what happened. So, so I think in that in that visceral nature, you're totally right. And, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh yeah, fond memories of seeing that movie for the first time. You know, did, did your jaw hit the ground? <laughs> oh yeah, just just all of it. You know, just going to like a big, you know, the theater in Chinatown in New York City, just to be like, we gotta see it. You know? Yeah, that. That movie was phenomenal, you know. Speaking of movies, because if we forget one of the big things we said we were going to talk about, and I know we're a little a little late to the table because everybody's kind of given their two cents, but we wanted to give our two cents on uh, Shang Chi and the Legend yeah. of the Ten Rings because that is a that fits the bill for us in every which way. It's a kung fu movie based on a kung fu comic book, and um, so so you you saw you've seen it, right? I have seen it. Great. So maybe maybe you can kind of give your your uh, your your little review, your thoughts on it. What what do you think about it? I was so glad that I didn't have to write it. I mean, I wanted to write a review of it, but I was so glad I didn't have to because then I could just like luxuriate in enjoying it okay. without having to be critical. So I think uh, I think that says a lot. I mean, I think the fact that like walking away, I was. I couldn't help but feel as though the first half of it was just a kung fu. Yeah. So right off the bat, like it, it just by virtue of the fact that it that a Marvel movie got me to forget it was a Marvel movie, that was a victory right there. Yeah. You know the fact that it could um it took a very you know and which was really interesting because I had the good fortune of talking to Gene Gene mm -hmm. Luen Yang who's writing the current oh, yeah. comic series mm -hmm. for Shang Chi mm -hmm. and. Like the one thing he said to me about it was how he is often, how can I say it? Like he really wanted to give uh, Shang-Chi internality, right? He wanted to give him a very much a personal life and get him away from like the, the stereotypes of the martial artist. Mm -hmm. And so I remember him mentioning how gratified he was that even though the movie is a very different origin story, a very different scenario they were still striving for that same concept of giving sure. the character shang chi you know more than just you know the title master of kung fu right so i think i think in that sense marvel was super smart in like not even titling the movie master of kung fu mm -hmm. and just really you know giving the character his own autonomy on that level and then just like building like building the character up as an mcu character rather than like an adaptation of a marvel property sure, sure so i thought i thought that was really kind of unique in terms of like because i mean it was a great as a movie it was a great iron fist adaptation you mm -hmm. know like the, the the heart of the dragon was totally out of iron fist yeah but you know there was no resemblance to an iron fist movie, <laughs> you know well, I don't know if you saw the Iron Fist TV show, and I know it's it's I have to I have to give my real opinion. We got an Iron Fist TV series, but this was the Iron Fist movie we all deserved. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean that's the thing. It, it trans like it transcended both, right? Mm -hmm. it, it became sound like the MCU does not need an Iron Fist because their Shang-Chi really slots in to capture like that that genre. I mean, okay, well. What's your thought on how it went full kaiju in the third act? <laughs> oh, to be honest, for me, I would have rather they they held off for like a second movie or something to go that far. I felt like there was enough for them to unpack up to that point, you know. And mm -hmm. I was and 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 I kind of got a little bit lost in the spectacle at that point. I, I love the first uh, two thirds of the movie. Um, mm -hmm. the, once they got into the mystical stuff, I understand it's a, it's a big blockbuster, but I felt. You know, there's a certain, you know, for me personally, and even in the comic books, sometimes I enjoyed the street level characters the most because it felt like the stakes were the highest. And because the stakes were the highest, it was the most interesting characters, you know, mm -hmm. um, like I, I found, you know, like a Daredevil story where he's fighting the Kingpin way more interesting sometimes than some of the Avengers stories, just because it, depending on who was on the creative team at the time, it just seemed more interesting. So for me, the whole the whole full kaiju um you know, monster spectacle. I, I didn't. It didn't feel earned to me. I, I would have liked to have seen a couple, at least one full movie where it was a little bit more street level, and then he graduates to that that next level. But I think, you know, Marvel movies definitely have their agenda in terms of the the bigger picture of what they're trying to tell and the roadmap of where they're trying to get to. And maybe that's why they did it. What 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 did you think about the whole um, 
mystical creature portion. I mean, I, I, I'm a, I'm a huge fan for all mythology and then Asian mythology in particular. So to be able to see, you know, a key rain and it's natural and, and, you know, environment. What was that little chicken pig thing? That was like <laughs> a, a little, a little pigu maybe or something like that. I forgot. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, in terms of like seeing those, those concepts realized, uh -huh. delightful, you know, I was yeah. getting epic, uh, never ending story vibes from the guardian you know so that's a, that's a very good point i didn't i didn't think about that but you're right that was very similar definitely so yeah i mean i think that was so i think that was like that kind of um wish fulfillment just had to be in there you know so so in that sense i, I kind of enjoyed that the one thing i do think marvel has a a problem with is the faceless hordes you know like mm -hmm. oh yeah you know, and I mean, it's not just Marvel. It's just like superhero movies are getting trapped by that Lord of the Rings convention of of a faceless horde. Yeah. And so I think that's going to be like, that's always going to be a minefield until they figure out what to do differently. And, and they could have done it, you know, like, why couldn't they have done a Big Trouble and Little China style, like, chi projections of them as like giant you know holographic warrior versions of themselves to fight the demon you know why couldn't totally. why couldn't that devour that that demon be more like a you know the horse head guardian of the gates of hell from chinese mythology you know yeah. like they were so close they could have gone a little bit more into it but then they they zig instead of zagging, I guess. No, that's, that's very true. And I'm glad you brought up Big Trouble in Little China because, of course, one of the best and, and probably hands on the best American martial arts movie of all time. And um, and I think I think I think what they got is the hordes had faces. I mean, it was like a rose gallery. I mean, they made sure when you're watching the movie and you see the hordes of people and the goons, uh, you saw all the all the very unique faces, right? You saw the Aliangs and the you know all those guys there, and and yeah, when it's a faceless mob of kind of you know goons or you know just foot soldiers, it just doesn't. You know, I, I'd say when you, you were comparing to some of it, like when you think about Lord of the Rings, they made sure to have shots where they zoomed in on the individual orcs' faces, and you could see how different each of them looked and see their personalities come off, even if it was just for a little shot. But usually when a lot of the Marvel movies get to that, it's all the exact same looking kind of Stormtrooper character. Yeah, well, you know, the, the biggest, the most egregious um, offender in the case of Faceless Hordes would be uh, the, the first Suicide Squad movie. Oh my, literally, right? <laughs> right, yeah, where it just, like, they literally were just like, okay, Faceless Hordes. I mean, I think the second Suicide Squad redeemed it because oh, yeah. they returned to the canon and actually delivered in like, you know, what, the original baseless horde should have been like oh, you yeah. know and then starro i mean come on <laughs> exactly exactly but i i think i think with with shang chi i think it was definitely like the marvel the, like leaning into the marvel formula of everyone's need needs their little moment give give aquafina a chance to do something with her bow and arrow and yeah <laughs> you know and then just a little bit of hand waving you know by that time I mean, the real climax was Shang Chi versus his father. You yes. know, that was that was the true combat. So, the kaiju stuff after it just was, uh, you know, yeah, serves I, serves the other masters, I guess. Yeah, I could have I could have gone with the end fight being strictly him and uh, Wen Wu fighting. And, uh, and Tony Lung just killed it. I mean, it was amazing to see him speaking in an English speaking role and just see how he was so successfully able to bring all that charisma and charm and just his depth of his acting. Um, to me, he was my favorite part of the of the film. He's, he's He was amazing. So that was really cool. Oh, I agree. I mean, especially considering the like the ignoble, you know, the ignoble origins of the Shang-Chi mm -hmm. property. Oh, yeah. You know, like, they just knew that they had to redeem that. And, you know, every step of the way, like every casting choice, I think, was was to that end, you know, to give that that sense of legitimacy to it, you know, so to have Tony Long be like, yeah. you know, the progenitor in there, that was awesome, you know. 
Absolutely. And, 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 you know, for, for those people watching that, that aren't aware, I mean, I think some of the idea was conveyed, but choreography wise, it was very clever, right? Which was T Tony Lung's character did a lot of the more hard aggressive styles uh, of Kung Fu. And the, the mother was Tai Chi through and through. And if you understand the two is that, that bounce of that yin yang kind of balance. I thought that was expertly choreographed and really done well by Brad Allen. I, I wish they would have maybe given a nod a little bit more, explain that more to the audience so they could benefit more from that that philosophy of the whole mm -hmm. thing. Um, but I, I always look at things through the eyes of somebody who teaches Kung Fu. So I always want to hear them say, master of Kung Fu. I always want them to say, this is Tai Chi, because of course I have I have a skin in the game, if that makes sense. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I mean, I think of it as like, we all know that People are going to be coming to that movie, and they're going to see that, and they're going to they're going to say, "Water bending, yeah. air bending." <laughs> you know, like there's already kind of a pop culture lexicon mm -hmm. that that those who know know it covers real territory, right? Yeah, like, there's true kung fu mastery behind those choices of what you know of how water bending was depicted versus sure. air. So, in a sense like marvel benefited from that work already being done mm -hmm. you know and they could have added to the to that language a little more sure. you know they kind of like play played it safe mm -hmm. boy the more i talk about this movie the more i sound like i didn't like it, <laughs> I didn't like it you know well you're analyzing you're analyzing it right and, and that and, and there's nothing wrong with that you know and you know, on that note about about the martial arts, like that's the thing. That's why one of the big reasons why I'm doing my 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 kung fu comic book is it's like I will say this is tai chi. I will say this is here, and I I I will explain the philosophy. You know, like in in martial arts and in kung fu, you know, basics, foundation is the key, right? Stances mm -hmm. are the key. And even in my first issue, I have a sequence where the main character is practicing their stances. You know, and and you know that's those things are important because that's kind of part of the, the journey that's not always told, right? You know, um, I always tell my Gong Fu students that, you know, you watch the movies and you see the training montage, which lasts five minutes to a music. And it's kind of like, okay, well, it can't be that hard. Well, there is a montage, but the montage lasts about 10 years in real life. And when people realize that they're not as quick to uh, continue continue the journey, if that makes sense. It's, it's true. I mean, you could, I mean, you can kind of tell based on on their their movie preferences as well, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. how many people will gravitate towards the Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon style of kung fu movie, mm -hmm. where it's it's the sword, the magic sword does the trick, you know? Yeah. And then on the other end of the spectrum is like Master Killer, Thirty Six Chamber, where the whole <laughs> movie is the workout Ring. scene, you know? And it's this, every step of the way, you see how how much this dude suffers to get to get that little grain of rice. You know? Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's exactly the thing. It's like, how, you know, that's the balancing act is how do you convey, how do you adapt the one art form via the other art form, you know? Exactly, you know, I was joking with with, with our friend, uh, Jean Ching, who's the, the pu you know, the, I'm not if we can say former publisher because Kung Fu Tai Chi still is uh, available online, but the mm -hmm. publisher of Kung Fu Tai Chi, um, and, and I was telling him, it's funny, you know, I, I teach Kung Fu, which is kind of an, an old art form that's not easy and not always accessible but for people because it's not um, instant gratification, right? And I decided to supplement that with another archaic art form, which is comic books. So, you know, hopefully two archaic uh, art forms can produce something modern. That's, that's, that's the hope. I know, I know, exactly. <laughs> I, can, I can relate. I mean, we often joke at the print magazine, we, all, we often joked about the perils of of raising dinosaurs, you know, and that at, at a certain point they're going to go extinct, you know? Yeah, exactly, you know. Right, but I mean, these things are like also labors of love, you know, so anyone, like, anyone can do a comic, right? You could just write some stuff down and draw stick figures and that is a comic, you know, but, but then there's more, like, you know, what, like the mission to convey more, to convey more than just an action sequence, right? To convey a story, to convey the philosophies, you know? Like, that's one thing, like, I look at when I was doing Tiger's Tale as a single page comic for the magazine, right? There wasn't too, like, 
on occasion I could squeeze in one, a, a, one an extra page and devote um, an episode to like a fight sequence, you know, two pages of fighting or something. Yeah. But mostly it was about like conveying, you know, picking up where I left off, conveying that little bit of philosophical information that's trying to be conveyed and then moving on to the next, you know, the next setup. Yeah. You know, exactly. and so it's a, uh, to be able to do that on a larger format, right? To do it as a graphic novel, multiple hundred, more than a hundred pages, you know, there are still fight sequences, but then there's also the opportunity to, to, to spend time in quiet moments and how many, you know, how many, how many panels can be devoted to, to a sequence about meditation, yeah. you know, or like yeah. how many, how many panels can you can be used to convey bad feng shui as a comment as a concept you know yeah. no that's that's absolutely you know um i just got a text we'll be having another another guest coming in towards the end of this panel but mm -hmm. um in in, we have a, in about eight minutes or so before that person comes in you know i i want to touch on that i would be curious if you could kind of talk about this latest iteration of tiger's tail and and you know what's coming up if you can kind of just kind of give us a glimpse or you know an idea of What's what's coming down the pipeline? Because we're about how many months out from from the release date? We are just under six months. Okay. So we're twenty. We're approaching twenty weeks out. Uh -huh. um, so Tiger's Tail, Tiger's Tail has been around since long before Avatar: The Last Airbender hit Nickelodeon. Right? It was in the back pages of Kung Fu Magazine, and it was truly dedicated towards taking, you know, some of the most arcane um, bits of information that kung fu masters would share with me as an aside while we were doing you know while we would be doing a photo shoot about that specific style i would be asking random questions about the creation myths behind their style and they would just convey these little bits of wisdom and these little philosophical anecdotes that i would swirl away and then kind of use to inform the story of Tiger's Tale, which is really kind of the concept of, how can I say it? The, a tiger that doesn't want to be a tiger gets in trouble for his jealousy. And he's got to come to terms with the fact that really being a tiger is just enough, That's right? Cool. So it's um it touches on all of these you know, I, I spent months working on like a perfect two sentence elevator pitch. <laughs> yeah. You know, when I'm given the chance to give you that two sentence elevator pitch, I'm instead oh, no, telling you great. everything else. You this know? is great. But, um, but yeah, so the concept is this tiger was meant to be like the zodiac tiger of Chinese mythology. But instead, he is forced to have two human adopted brothers mm -hmm. and so he's got to grow up watching two humans learn all of the lessons that the forest has to offer but as a tiger all he's got to do is learn how to be a tiger cool. that little bit of jealousy causes him to make some youthful indiscretions which ultimately throws the Tao of the universe out of whack it's great you know and then he's got to spend his adulthood kind of reconciling this mistake by seeking out his estranged brothers and together they have to go and put things right that's awesome because you know and, and it just even without talking as much about the martial arts aspect it sounds so martial arts because martial arts is about that, that inner struggle right i mean it's 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 coming to terms and confronting those things your inner demons you know and and most people get into it myself included not understanding that you know but the more you delve deeper the only way you can get to the other side of progress is by confronting those things and 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 there's very few things that's more visceral more in your face than martial arts training you know um you often find out that you know as cliched as it is the real enemy is yourself right and that's mm -hmm. that's that's who you're fighting you know and not just even literally we do forms we do sequences where you're blocking well I'm always blocking a technique that's against somebody that's my exact same height and my exact same build. I'm not blocking up here where it's somebody taller than me. It's literally myself. And so it's that that kind of ebb and flow of the tide. And so that I, I love to hear that there's that kind of internal struggle 
in, in your in your work. That's going to be great. So yeah, I mean, I think the when when I I was presenting it to a peer group, mm -hmm. and um, someone asked me, "Is it a story or is it a fable?" And I could only answer yes. <laughs> it's, it's all it's all. Yeah, I mean, it's it's um the log line is um it's uh the Tao Te Ching meets the Jungle Book. Nice, you know? nice. So here, you know, it's it's like the lessons of Taoism and how how can a jealous animal find its place in the world? How can humans find their place in their world? What is it like for humans who are always in the right place at the right time? How do they demonstrate that? Yeah. So, I mean, the story takes you to Shaolin Temple. You know, it takes you to very, you know, that you get to explore various uh, mythologies you know that that are behind the kung fu mystique you know but it's really not about people fighting martial arts so much as as it is about the the conflict of idea i mean there are monsters too so you get to fight giants and you know ogres and that sort of thing it's much more you know fantastic it's the whole principle is that the art like the art reflects the internal the art the art turns the internal external yeah right so all internal conflicts are externalized on the page Absolutely. and so that that's been my job as an artist is to kind of try and convey you know what those internal conflicts would look like and make it fun for a young reader who may just be starting out as a white belt in their taekwondo classes or their you know just beginning their wushu training after school you know i want it to be something that that's fun and fantastical but within it there'll be lessons and gags and you know insights that's what's great about the art form is you can convey those lessons in a different format right you know, I, I tell my students with the Kung Fu is the Kung Fu isn't the kicking and punching and all that stuff. That's the vehicle to get you to the destination, but that's not the actual thing. This is a method, and that's why traditions are important. Traditions are proven methods. It's the method to get you to where you're supposed to be, but it's not the end result, right? And, and you know, um, in my book, that's kind of the, the goal is, is, is kind of to take a story that's kind of fantastical about, about a young man who hears about this mythical figure called the shadow ghost and starts to investigate it and starts to train kung fu but the goal is that you see somebody start from the very basics of kung fu and then rise to the point where they have a, a mastery of the skill you know and as well as there's you know mystery intrigue you know all that great stuff but but i always like it when the journey feels well well earned you know, I want you, when you see the main character fighting the big bad guy and doing phenomenal Kung Fu moves, I want you to remember who he was when he was a, a young boy, not knowing much, you know? And mm -hmm. to take the, the the reader along that path, I think would be fun, you know? So um, I do see that our guest is here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna invite him in. Um, I think he's gonna be joining us just by phone, so he won't have a visual. Um, but let me go ahead and we'll let him in here and I'll introduce him to everybody. And so the person that we have here is independent recording artist, Capitan Wallace. Wallace, can you hear me? Yeah, I got you, Curtis. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, well, Wallace, so this is Patrick. Patrick, this is Wallace. Hi Thank there. You. So we were just talking about about um, kung fu and comic books and kung fu movies, and um, I know you're you're a big fan of kung fu movies, aren't you? Sure, <laughs> I do. Yeah, yeah. So that that's kind of one of the fun things is is you know I, I I met Wallace online, and I started seeing him have these really cool music videos and things, and it became very apparent to me that that he loves kung fu movies because it works his way into his his art and his music. Um, um, Walt, what would be some of your, your favorite Kung Fu movies that have kind of influenced you? Iron Monkey. Iron Monkey is oh. one of my favorites. Yeah, sure. That's a classic. Classic, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I love that movie. I can watch many, many times, you know? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. 
And the funny thing is I didn't realize until later that Wallace and I are, are Kung Fu brothers. I started seeing Wallace post photos inside the Kung Fu studio that I trained at, the YC Wong Kung Fu studio in San Francisco, Chinatown. And then we found out that we're actually classmates. So so, so Wallace, uh, maybe you could tell everybody just briefly about how you, you came to study um, at the studio. Yeah, I've been training there for the last, I think, four or five years. Because uh -huh. it was like when I get here for the first time in America, uh -huh. I was living there just right there in Chinatown in Sacramento. Okay. And I have my background uh, cooking. Mexico I was training that and uh -huh. I was looking for something like similar but then I see the studio just in front of my apartment and I was like okay I gotta go there and I started with uh, and, and Shifu Ray uh -huh. and I was just getting in love with the place you know yeah it, it looks like a kung fu movie when you when you go into that studio it, it, it's literally in the basement in Chinatown and it, it looks like being in a Kung Fu movie. So I felt the same way when I went there. And um, our Sifu, every, everybody's Sifu is like their dad. So everybody thinks their dad's the best kind of situation. But, but Wai Si Wang is, is, is pretty amazing. So I think we're both really lucky to have studied with him. He's legendary. I mean, I can tell you objectively, his reputation <laughs> is legendary. He's legendary. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and uh, we were fortunate, um, Pat, Pat uh, when, I, when I, I got, I wrote an article on my Sifu for Kung Fu Tai Chi magazine. And Patrick was there, you know, helping out with everything. We did the photo shoot, and so that was, was a really great day. Wow. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, well, Wallace, um, we were going to show one of your music videos, but we figured be briefly before we do, maybe you could, or maybe maybe better if I'll, I'll describe it and you can correct me. Okay, how does that sound? Um, yeah, yeah. W Wallace's music is is really cool, really interesting. You know, he incorporates. Um, you know, not only kind of modern guitar and things like that, and, but he also incorporates a lot of classical Chinese instruments. But that's kind of, I don't know if I'm explaining it well. I don't know, Floss, if you could be, if you could explain a little bit to everybody about, about your music and kind of your your art. Sure. Yeah, I think the, my own art, the music, it's super influenced by Chinese culture too. And the, the last years, I've been writing a lot of music like, and I've been learning an uh, instrument, like ancient instrument called Guchin. Mm -hmm. Guchin is like a flat guitar. I always say like, it's like a guitar's grandmother or even more, you know? And that's why I feel like so comfortable and so familiar with that instrument. And when I see it for the first time, the sound is so heal sound you know you can feel it on your on your on your inner you can feel on your on your brain also and and i was like wow i have to learn how this instrument play you know and then after a while you know i'm just like start to mix with the guitar with uh some beats like uh california beats you know like so influ influenced by by Oakland music, you know, like hip hop. And then I was like, I'm gonna try my own. I'm gonna mix my Kung Fu moves. I'm gonna mix my Gucci. I'm gonna mix my guitars. And and yeah, the results is Capitan Wallace. And I mix a little bit of everything, you know. And one of the things like I love of this place of California is the, the diversity of cultures, you know. You can get uh, some a little bit from here, a little bit from there, and, and make your own, you know. And that's happened with my music. Absolutely, it's it's really eclectic, but in the best way possible, from from what I know. So, um, what what I what I thought would be cool is if we share one of uh, Wall, uh, you know, Capitan Wallace's videos, and um, maybe you could go ahead and tell us uh, the name of the song. Uh, we're going to show the video, everybody. Um, Feel free to watch the music video and then we'll come back with a with a little uh, special announcement before we finish up our panel. So uh, Wallace, what, what music video will we be showing everybody today? All right, we're gonna watch one of my favorites, Love On. I perform a little bit of hunger there, kind of a dancing hunger by myself. And the music, like I say, it's beats on the background. We got a good chin, we have a guitars, like some funky guitars and Hope you like it. It's in my YouTube channel. So it's love on and enjoy it. 
Okay, and so everybody feel free to stay with us. This is Love On by Capitan Wallace. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. I, I love that video because you kind of look like a uh, like a superhero, you know, with the mask and all. So that's very cool. Um, speaking of superheroes or Kung Fu superheroes with masks, uh, Capitan Wallace and I have something important to share, a special announcement. And um, I think I'll, I'll hand it over to him. Maybe you can tell everybody what our special collaboration is that's going to be coming out very soon. Yeah, like you say, and I'm so excited to to announce this. And yeah, it's the time. And Captain Wallace, and Shadow Ghost, and Tiger Crane, we are working on some um, awesome together. It's gonna be a music video for my next song, all inspired by Shadow Ghost comic book, writing by this great Sifu, Sifu Curtis, and. And it's going so so really good. We've been talking the last the last weeks with Curtis, and we are creating awesome awesome work, and we are so excited, right? Uh, absolutely, and, and I, I hope it's okay. I let everybody know. So the music video is filmed in San Francisco Chinatown, and at the YC Wong Kung Fu Studio, and 
and features kung fu performances by Sifu Utoni Wong, one of the top students of my Sifu, my, my big kung fu brother, and his daughter, uh, the kung fu champion Megan Wong. So um, look forward to it, and we'll, more announcements coming soon, and we'll let everybody know when it's about to go live. Sounds good, Wallace? Sounds perfect, Curtis, and for sure, we are so excited, like I said, and the song is really good. I'm featuring with Alan Jeep too, uh, mm -hmm. produced by Dave Schul, and it's going to be awesome, and awesome artists create a kung fu, a lot of kung fu moves, and hope you enjoy it when it drops. Absolutely. So on that note, um, maybe we'll go ahead and finish up the panel. And so I'm going to go around everybody and, and, you know, you can go ahead and just kind of reintroduce yourself to the audience. Let everybody know uh, where they can get a hold of you, uh, you know, online and also uh, any updates or anything you want to know about your future projects. So let's let's start with Patrick. Patrick, um, maybe you could share with everybody um, your your information. All right. So you can find me online at plugoarts.com that's p-l-u-g-o-a-r-t-s.com i have a fun little monthly newsletter that includes uh web comics and a few other uh freebies that i like to add i've also just launched a new website for my forthcoming project called a tiger's tale um that website is a tiger's tale.com uh, be sure to spell it T-I-G-E-R-T-A-L-E, -E, add an A at the beginning. So it's A-T-I-G-E-R-T-A-L-E.com. Uh, also, you'll get monthly features there. Um, next week, we'll have one by the Kung Fu master we all know and love, named Curtis Fujita. I'm very excited to... Uh, I, I was so excited by the article that, that you wrote for it that I did a illustration specifically for it, which will be available exclusively for subscribers, but then eventually to the general public. But you can find me online at PLUGO on Twitter or Plugo Arts on Instagram and Facebook. But uh, yeah, just look for PLUGO and you'll find me eventually. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, Capitan Wallace, maybe you can let everybody know how they can find you online and kind of stay updated on all your work. Sure. All right, guys, this is Capitan Wallace. And don't forget to follow me and all my social media. I am on Instagram, like Capitan Wallace, Capitan or Capitan, whatever you want to say. And I'm on Facebook, like Capitan Wallace. You can find me on YouTube. My official youtube channel is like capitan wallace so and i'm on spotify i'm on apple music i'm pandora i'm everywhere just type capitan wallace and some come up and remember this is the guy and we got some some news coming check it out check the tiger crane check the shadow ghost page and peace absolutely and then for myself again i'm i'm curtis fujita you can find me online there's I have two kind of passions, Kung Fu and comic books. So for Kung Fu, I teach online Kung Fu classes. So you can find all the information about my school, tigercrane.net. Uh, you can also find us on Facebook, Tiger Crane Kung Fu, and also on YouTube and Instagram, Tiger Crane 805. And then uh, for my comic book, it's Shadow Ghost. You can find it as Shadow Ghost Comic on Facebook, Shadow Ghost Comic on Instagram. As I say, it's the kung fu comic by a kung fu master and also i'm part of the silver line crew uh, we have live streams uh, weekly i'm on the sunday stream and uh, you can find us online silver line comics i um, want to thank everybody for coming and thanks to you know to patrick and uh capitan wallace you know I'm, I'm very fortunate to be collaborating with both of them not only do I have the article coming out on on patrick's tiger's tail a tiger's tail uh social media and newsletter and everything but also patrick did a phenomenal drawing of shadow ghost that i have to now work very hard to live up to the quality of and i will be i will be sharing that but but he did a phenomenal job so I, i'll be i'll be dropping that very soon on my uh, social media and uh with uh capitan Walsh, i'm so excited the music video he he sent me some uh, screenshots of, of the editing process it looks amazing so i can't wait to share with everybody and um at the end of the day, this is what it's about. It's collaborating with people 
with similar interests and people that are, are good people. So um, thank you guys. Thank everybody for, for watching. Uh, please make sure to stay updated with us. And uh, if everybody's cool with it, maybe we can do this again sometime. What do you guys think? I am already looking forward to the next one. Okay, what are you guys doing in the next hour? Because I, uh, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm gonna gonna <laughs> All right. Well, everybody, take care. Thank you so much for joining us. And we will see you next time, okay? <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. Nice to meet you. Thank All you, right. Kurt. Thank you, Chris. Have you done. Hello, I'm Sifu Curtis Fujita with Tiger Crane Kung Fu. I just wanted to let everybody know that we do have an online program that we're utilizing, not just for our enrolled students that come to our physical location, but also for students who are in other states, other time zones, other countries. It's a unique program with multiple components uh, that really help you learn Kung Fu and Tai Chi at home during the current health epidemic and beyond. Uh, so we have different components. The first part is, of course, Zoom classes. We have online Zoom classes that meet throughout the week for Kung Fu and Tai Chi. Uh, we also have a unique thing which we call our rerun program. And what that means is we record the Zoom classes and we have an archive of dozens and dozens of videos for you to access at any time anywhere as long as you have an internet connection. So if you missed a class, you can go ahead and follow along and check it out. Or if you want to remember something that was mentioned in the class, you can go back and watch the rerun. It's an archive uh, for all enrolled members. Also, we have uh, personal videos. And what I mean by that is if you film yourself doing an individual technique, you can send it to me and I'll be happy to shoot my own video with a response detailing specifically uh, what you want to do to improve the exercise and do it most efficiently. And lastly, we even have a social club component. And what that essentially means is, you know, when you're at a gym or a martial arts studio, it's that sense of community, the ability to visit with your classmates, with your teacher after class to, you know, socialize. So we have a social club meeting. So once a week after class, we have a Zoom session and we talk for a little bit and catch up with each other and socialize. So these are all the different components that make our unique online Kung Fu program. If you're interested, feel free to reach me at my email address. It's instructor at tigercrane.net. Again, instructor at tigercrane.net. We would love to see you in our online studio. Thank you very much for joining us and we look forward to hearing from you and take care.